yes, people are discontented with the bad storytelling, but it doesn't necessarily mean that if you give them good stories, they're going to live good lives. The proof in the pudding is that if you listen to all these people, people like the critical drinker and and his ilk that have been uh, critiquing the the new Lord of the Rings series even before they managed to see it, uh, their uh, reference point or their relationship with, with with the show is almost one of religious awe. Um, they they for them the experience of the story has has become a, akin to. Uh, a religious experience. And so when it's wrong, they react to it not as frustrated artists, but as people who walked into a heretical church. Right. And I'm saying this not to not to make fun of them. Um, I, I understand what's going on, I think. And it's, uh, it's, it's a function of where we are in this civilization. It's a function of the decadence of, of Western Christendom and the level that it is. This is Jonathan Pajot. Welcome to the Symbolic World. So hello, everyone. I'm really excited to be back with Nicholas Kotar. For those who follow the channel, you've seen him a few times on uh, having discussions about all kinds of things. He is a writer himself. He just published a novella called The Son of the Deathless in his Raven Sun series. But we're also going to talk about this particular culture moment of what kind of stories we can tell in the strange times that we are living. So, Nicholas, first of all, congratulations on the new book. Thank you. It's uh, the the pandemic killed storytelling for me, or at least the act of storytelling. Uh, so this is the first thing I've written in first long thing I've written in almost two years. Yeah, well, they, you know, the idea people seem to think that they said you know, you're locked in your house you know you're mm -hmm. you know, this is a good time to to do but it not always because no. it, it was there was such an oppressive we're in such an oppressive state it's not easy to get those creative juices flowing let's say no i mean creative juices don't come out of a vacuum they come out of out of a uh a, a craft a, a ritual and when when the ritual is destroyed because everything about your life is no longer ritualized and it's you're stuck in this massive uh, i mean it's it's the doom right it's just around you all the time and you can't hide from it and that's that's not conducive so no yeah it didn't help <laughs> and so um yeah tell us first of all maybe tell us a little bit about what the what the the premise of the this new novella is and then we'll move into our strange time and strange storytelling sure uh the the story I think we're going to talk. We're going to be talking about this. I think a lot, but it, it came it came at me in a very weird way. Um, I used to think that we created our own stories. I used to think that it was a matter of uh, kind of sitting down and assembling certain pieces of things together. You know, reading Russian fairy tales, coming up with a concept from that, and kind of weirdly meshing things, and then allowing the story to come out of the structure. Um, not that necessarily I'm, I'm an outliner or anything like this, but it story is usually used to come out from from a fairly regimented and structured uh, kind of approach to, to to writing for me. But um, right around COVID time, this probably would have been it's already more than two years ago now. I was I took a course with um, our mutual friend Paul Kingsnorth, uh, which uh, which was called Rewilding Your Words. I didn't know what it, what, what, what was going to happen, but I knew that it was something that I, that I needed to experience just because Paul was such a compelling figure. And I was really curious to see what would happen. And I came in with a, with one idea of what I would do. I thought, okay, this is going to help me write more beautiful setting. Like it's going to allow me to, uh, to make my writing more pretty basically. And what it did instead was break me in, in pieces. <laughs> um, the course is wonderful. Uh, uh, Jonathan, you and I are are members of, uh, are both teachers in a new program that we talked about uh, on on a different podcast, St. Basil School of Writing. Paul's joined us there, but um, he's teaching a version of that of this uh, course for St. Basil School, and so I'm really excited to see how that's going to work because it's he what he what he effectively does is not, it doesn't teach you anything about how to structure or craft your writing. He teaches you how to how to be in tune with 
the natural world around you in ways that will then allow for a story to emerge that's almost a, a kind of um, duet between you and, and the world that you live in. So he speaks a lot about allowing the setting, the place to be a character in, in and of itself. He writes that way. You've read The Wake, I mm -hmm. think. Oh, no, you, you read Beast. Beast, yeah. Yeah, well, the, the setting there is, I mean, the beast is the setting in a lot of ways. And yeah. although the, the creature does show up at the end, in the end, it's a kind of incarnation, you know, of, of the of the land that he is having this spiritual battle with. So he, he has this very strong sense in his own writing of that. Um, and what it did for me is it, it opened up an entirely new and different way of accessing the, the what Tolkien would call the cauldron of story, that kind of uh, common source that everybody takes their stories from, but in a way that isn't structured, in a way that isn't planned, in a way that is very surprising and very odd. Mm -hmm. And it fit for me at that moment because as the world was crumbling around me, um, a lot of people went the opposite way, right? They went to just super regimented kind of lifestyles. And sometimes that came out in in the tenor of the way that they talked about it, right? You have to find structure in your side yourself. You, you, you try to write, regiment everything around. You try to find the reason why these things are happening. You become rational. You become hyper um, rationalistic mm -hmm. in either one direction or the other, right? We've seen, we've seen both extremes during the pandemic. Um, that is not good for story. Uh, it's, it doesn't, I mean, you could write stories out of that, and in fact, many of the stories that we're watching right now on Disney Plus and all the other streams uh, are coming from exactly that thing. Um, I don't want to do that. I had no desire to do that. Yeah, so, those stories end up looking like utilitarian or propaganda. They they tend yeah. to be focused on a kind of really clear purpose, let's say, in terms of the, yeah. the story. Yeah, definitely. Well, it's, I mean purpose driven or or theme driven storytelling is something that everybody does right so it's not yeah. it's not it's necessarily a bad thing but when your purpose um overwhelms the story uh i noticed it for the first time actually when i saw wandavision um there was there were a few scenes in there when the writers stopped writing a story and they started to write a lecture yeah and it was really it was really annoying it it took me out of the story completely and and it shouldn't have because that was such a experimental and weird um kind of uh, story that uh, the WandaVision was, or at least it was trying to be. I don't think it ultimately succeeded. I don't think it was very good. But um, one of the things that went against it was that they didn't lean into the weirdness. The weirdness became window dressing for for a very conventional story. Um, that you know, if I haven't watched uh, Doctor Strange, but I, I've read about it, and I know that that you were exactly right in your predictions about this being simply nothing more than than self crowning, like a kind of yeah. It's really bad. Demonic apogee, yeah. But it's interesting to notice how the let's say because I grew up in a in a in a Protestant kind of evangelical world, and I wrote three plays that were within that context and had some evangelistic purposes. Like that's not yeah. all they were, but they definitely needed to have that inside the play. Right. And every time I remember, like I remember writing them and real and and writing it and realizing oh i need to have that moment yeah. and that yep. like moment in the play and i cringe every time i every yep. time i think of it and now when yep. i watch that's why i find it so difficult to watch christian movies i had such a deep oh, yeah. a deep uh experience with that because i wrote three of those myself and i produced them and we toured and we did all that and so it's like when I see it, I'm like, oh, this is so painful. But I never thought that I would see it in the Hollywood movies as much as I'm seeing it now. So it's well, interesting because it's, because it's bad screenwriting. Every, and everybody knows it's bad screenwriting. But uh, there's something going on in Hollywood. Not a, I don't know if we want to talk about this too much, but it's becoming clear uh, more and more. And so this is something that came out in, in Barry Weiss's podcast, or it may have been her Substack. But she talked about how, and I'm not I'm not quoting this, so if I'm getting it wrong, I do apologize. But she basically was quoting an insider who said that, after the George Floyd um, riots, there was a an, a um, mandate from heaven, yeah. not heaven, <laughs> yeah, a, a mandate from not heaven uh, that said, "Get rid of all the old guys and uh, make sure you diversify your core." Mm -hmm. Now, the the issue is, the problem is, and the this insider was very open about it, and I think uh, I don't know if it's a he or she. I believe he was anonymous. Uh, made it clear that the pool of possible screenwriters is small as it is. Because the life of a screenwriter in Hollywood is absolutely miserable. You get yeah. you get paid almost nothing, and you're working in you're working for these big shots that basically force you to do stuff and then put their own 
writing on top of yours they put their own name on your writing right and that's that's something that you accept if you want to live that life but there's not a lot of people that do and of those that are already there there's not that great of a percentage of uh, of a diverse population so in sort of shoehorning in the mandate what's happening is not that these people can't tell good stories it's that they haven't had the training and they're put in positions of you know leader of writing room uh and they're trying to tell good stories, but they haven't been trained in, in the absolute basics of storytelling. So they're defaulting to what they're seeing in the New York Times and in the cultural uh, conversation, which is a top-down speaking to wagging. Yeah. But that, I mean, that kills, that kills the immersion in story within as soon as it happens. And it doesn't matter what side you're on. Yeah. Even if you agree with it, you're not in the story anymore. You've just been pulled out. Definitely. So it yeah. brings us to our major point, which is, in this strange topsy turvy times, when even those, like, say that those that would portray even themselves as being the margin are now becoming moralist and finger wagging. Like, what yeah. kind of story can we tell, and how can we tell this story? Well, well, that was that was my thought, you know. And of course, as soon as I had that thought, I had to abandon the thought because if I start thinking like that, then the story I'm going to tell is not going to be story forward, but it's going to be theme forward. So if I'm thinking I need to tell a story that's going to embrace the margins. That's it. I've lost the game, right? So this is this is weird dance, and you know this. You're a, you're a creative. You understand, and especially a creative within within a you know within a tradition bound um, uh, craft such as iconography. There's always a dance between um, what you want to do and what the tradition tells you to do, and and what you hope uh, you're able to do in terms of your personal uh, input, but also you you want. You want to add something new, just you. That's also a dance with with the with the tradition. It's it's weird. It's it, it, it's a very strange. It's very different to that moment when, uh, in particular, when the premise becomes available to you, especially after after Paul's core. Yeah. So of course was to was to be able to write a the kind of premise that would be able to embrace the the margin that would be able to nudge people in that I want them to think and feel but without preaching to them and i tried to write it but from a from a place where i was where i had a very clear idea of what i wanted to happen right and it was a disaster it really didn't work i wrote a few scenes of this thing uh i had an idea of who the main character was i had an idea of who's what his motivations were going to be and i wrote it it was flowing beautifully and i put it aside for a bit stuff happened life etc and i got back to it and i started to read it and, and i hated i hated it with a with a burning passion it was like this is the worst thing i have ever written and i've been writing for years now this is this has not happened <laughs> um so i tried to remember paul king's north's um lessons i tried to let go of the story i i tried to let go of what i wanted the story to be i still had a sense of of who the character was i had a sense of what the setting was the timing within the larger um within the larger uh world that, that i write in and it took me going out into nature literally and being in the in the fresh air and not thinking not listening to podcasts not talking to anybody but just being in the world not the mechanical world of the city but out there because i live you know in cow country so it took it took me being out there for suddenly this thing to hit me and go, boom, this is where you have to go. And it wasn't me. You know, I don't know what it was. And I'm not the kind of person to say, God spoke to me. And therefore, and then I sat down and I wrote this thing and it was a, it was a col cooperation between me and God. No, I'm not going to say that. But whatever that voice was, it was there and it was outside of myself. And it then then began the song. And from then on out, it it just wrote. It just wrote itself, and it's different from the, the from the other stuff I wrote, in a lot of ways. It's a different voice. It's a different kind of. Um, uh, it's it's a different kind of character. It's a different kind of approach to storytelling, and I think I hope uh, it's basically I embraced my my fairy tale telling instincts. So instead of trying to tell an epic fantasy according to the epic fantastical uh, rule book, and there is a rule book of epic fantasy there. There are steps that you have to follow. There are things you have to do. Otherwise, the readers are like, this is an epic fantasy. I'll never read this again. So I threw that out. And I said, no, I'm telling a fairy tale. And I'm not retelling a fairy tale. I'm telling a new one, which is what people used to do all the time. And it used to be the center thing, right? It was the center of town. It was where the fireplace was. It's where everybody gathered in the evenings of the village. This used to be the activity of the center. 
And now the center is downtown. Now the center is Facebook. Now the center is whatever political insanity we're living through at the moment. The center is the thing that has gone utterly bonkers. So in going back to an older form of storytelling, I hope, oddly enough, I'm now, I think, I hope, embracing the storytelling tropes and techniques of the margin. Which means what for you? What do you think that means? Um, well, it, it started, it starts off with the process of writing itself in allowing the story to not be entirely limited by the, the tropes of what people expect it to be. So it's a difficult thing to, to balance the, the entertainment factor of a story because everybody wants to have a certain repeated pattern, of course. With the, uh, with the freshness, the newness of a story that has never been told before. But that has to have they have to be both. You can't have a story that's so unique and so new that has that you know that's never, that's never been told that nobody can relate to. Um, that's you know Marcel Duchamp. That's that's yeah. uh, that's um, yeah yeah atonal right. music. That's all the that's all the stuff that we've been we had to go through for the past fifty hundred years, right? So you have to figure out how to how to do that. But it also means, um, I think it means telling stories that are weird telling stories that are bizarre, using imagery that doesn't necessarily have immediate associations in people's minds, choosing characters that are fools, choosing characters that are children, and allowing the, 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 the setting of the world itself that you're writing to become a character and to dictate what happens. So this is really weird and it's very hard to do. Because a setting isn't a character, has no motivations, it's, it's a thing. But there are stories out there, and they're very interesting. Things like Alice in Wonderland, like the Gormenghast trilogy by, by uh, Mervyn Peake, like Lord of the Rings, um, where the setting itself is actually a character. It, it determines what, what the human characters do within the story to a, to a large extent. And it's not simply because there's mountains here and there's, and there's you know, a river there that you have to cross it's that the place itself has has its own spirit and that spirit will determine how the how the characters react as they walk through it that's not something you see in a lot of modern storytelling um because it's dangerous because mm -hmm. you, you don't know what's going to happen and you have to be as a storyteller you have to be more connected to natural the natural world to be able to do that realistically because if you're a writer who sits in the garret all day and has never walked outside and has never had the experience of touching a tree and feeling what the bark of a tree actually feels like has never seen the changing seasons on the same road year in year out and how the how the trees change in their color how they change in their shape and how just being in the same spot walking the same path every day for 365 days means that every single day is different this kind of rootedness, this kind of being in place, I produces very strong storytelling in good storytellers. I'm not including myself in the list yet, eventually, hopefully. But it's what I'm aiming for, and it's what I was trying to begin. And it's what Paul Kingsnort does so well. It's what Tolkien does so well. He was a rooted man. He was a man who was stuck in place. Mm -hmm. Right? He didn't travel a lot. He he but he was very at what at one with his with his natural world. Not this, you know, jet setting crazy world that, that we live in where you go on a plane every time you need to go to, on vacation where you're where, sorry, Jonathan, I know that you're you're about to enter into that world yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Traveling. So you sent me you sent me a quote by Martin Shaw, who for those who don't know, Martin Shaw, he's a mythologist storyteller from Ireland. He's been kind of appearing in this little corner, I guess, of the internet because he's had some he's a friend of Paul King's North and he's had some some uh, intimations of Christianity and orthodoxy, something which he thought he never uh, would have. I'm going to talk to him in the next few months. I'm not sure what, what day exactly, but it's going to happen. So you sent me this quote by him, and you said, when the center is in crisis, it is to the edges that we must attend. And so yeah. I thought that sounded a lot like when I say something like, watch the fools, you know, yeah. that, the, the, that the carnival in the end will flip back into, will bring back a kind of normal world. But what is it that you think that this can do for us at this moment? Well, it, I think we're, we're, we are storytelling creatures. We know that we talk about it a lot. And you and I have, have talked about this repeatedly. And I think we've become even a little bit too complacent in the idea that 
stories will change the world. We simply have to tell a good story. I don't think that's true uh, as as much as I thought before. And that's because we have a very educated and a very cultured um, people now. There's there are a lot of a lot of people that have access to high education, uh, and they're used to the kind of good storytelling that we're not seeing right now on television. And that's why you're seeing so much discontent in so many quarters about about the the level of of quality. But there's a yes, people are discontented with the bad storytelling, but it doesn't necessarily mean that if you give them good stories, they're going to live good lives. The proof in the pudding is that if you listen to all these people, people like the critical drinker and and his ilk that have been uh, critiquing the the new Lord of the Rings series even before they managed to see it, uh, their uh, reference point or their relationship with, with with the show is almost one of religious awe. Um, they they for them the experience of the story has has become a, akin to uh, a religious experience and so when it's wrong they react to it not as frustrated artists but as people who walked into a heretical church right don't don't recognize the exclamations or recognize the exclamations as being um you know, heretical, heretical, like, heretical exactly yeah. no that's a really good analogy it seems for sure that people that are freaking out about this new lord of the Rings series are really acting as if there is a heresy in front of them and it has to be denounced. It has to be expunged. You know, it has to be. And and you don't have to watch the thing. It's, it's, an, it's enough to know a few facts. It's enough to listen to the, uh, to the character, to the uh, actors talk about the thing. It's enough to listen to the, the, the show runners talk about the thing to be able to have all the necessary information that you need to battle the heresy because they're, they're apologists. They're not storytellers. Well, some of them are, but, um, and I'm saying this not to, not to make fun of them. Um, I, I understand what's going on, I think. And it's uh, it's it's a function of where we are in this civilization. It's a function of the decadence of of Western Christendom and the level that it is mm-hmm. at, at, at the historical moment that it is. So that means that if we simply, I think, if we simply revert to a kind of uh, hero's journey archetypal story over and over and over again, like we've talked about, like Star Wars, then the best that we can hope for is the kind of uh, cultural dominance through merchandising and LARPing that Star Wars has managed to exert over the world. Yeah. And if you, you know, if, obviously most people know that this is the case. If you don't read the book, How Star Wars Conquered the Universe, it's a fascinating history of the of the lore and, and, and what happened. It just gives you an idea of just how much this has a religious character for people who, you know, the kinds of people that Built from scratch, stormtrooper suits, uh, or or the Darth Vader suit. Not thinking for a moment, of course, that Darth Vader is supposed to be the a figure of evil, uh, because it's not about that. Um, so it's I don't think it's enough to have this kind of a watered down hero's journey thing anymore. Although we do need to have the kinds of fairy tale structures that Tolkien talks about in in his essay on fairy stories. The 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 structures that lead to the new catastrophe, the the sudden flip at the end. The way that we get there has to be weird now. It has to be odd. It has to be unexpected. It has to be bizarre. Purposely, right? And in Russia, you see this, by the way, in modern literature. So Russia, for because of the Soviet Union and because of um, the predominance of social realism, things like this, the way that the writers responded to it was by writing absurdist... Um, uh, what's, the, what's the technical term? Like super absurdist... Um, Magical realism. Yeah, like so, Ma- Master and Margarita. Like Master and Margarita. Exactly. That's the first one. But then it went even crazier with people like Viktor Pilevian, who is a very well-known is very well-known author internationally and, and is a consistent bestseller in Russia and writes absolutely insane, nihilistic, crazy, flipped bizarreness. And people drink, eat it up in Russia. They love it because, yeah. because they understand that he is a fool mm-hmm. and uh, he's very wise. So our job now is very difficult because we could go that route. We could go the route of the, of the absolute negator. Mm -hmm. Uh, We, Master Margarita did that very well, but in order to do that, uh, he had to rewrite the history of the gospel in a way that negated Christ's divinity. That was the only way he was going to be able to tell that story in a way that would work. So you have this incredible novel that, that has a very problematic uh, moral heart to it. Uh, It's all about, nihilism in a lot of ways 
yeah. as a res- as a response to this kind of good versus evil inverted thing that the Soviet Union was was pushing down everybody else's throats. So we can't go there. It's it's dangerous, right? Because because if we're honest about what we have to do as storytellers, we have these we have our listeners' souls in our in our hands, right? Cupped in our hands. They, if you're a good writer, as soon as you've plunged the the uh, the reader into your world, you're responsible for what happens to that person in that world it's it's scary yeah but it's it's true so you have to unsettle them you have to go to dark places you have to mess up their their very comfortable presuppositions about what the world is but you also have to do it in a way that reinforces the pattern the pattern of reality as you talk about all the time Mm -hmm. that's an incredibly hard thing to do technically as storytellers and that's the challenge that's ahead of us and that's what martin shaw is doing uh in in talking about his uh, th- that quote specifically he writes really bizarre weird stuff that's very fringe and very like kind of prose poetry kind of stuff that's that's very on the verge of of paganism christianity inspired by um you know the ancient myths but also speaking them in a language that's understandable and if you allow yourself to enter into it it can be really very interesting and very transformative in a lot of ways hmm and so who do you see as being, do you see Loris as being an example of that, yes. for example? Right. Yeah. Loris is funny because uh, on the one hand, it's, it's, very, it's a very conventional narrative. It's, it's, it follows all the beats of the saint's saint life, mm-hmm. of a particular kind of saint life. But if you're paying attention, um, there's a, and if you're reading it carefully, especially if you're reading it in Russian, it, the translation is good, but it doesn't, it doesn't do absolute justice, as no translation, of course, can. I can say that. I'm a translator. <laughs> Uh, um, it, there are some profoundly shocking moments in Loris. There's some really awful things that happen in Loris. Um, the the death of of his of his wife and child, uh, and the, uh, you know the inciting incident that leads to his yeah. becoming a saint. They're described in details that nobody should ever describe when talking about women and children. Yeah. Um, really horrifying stuff. So that's one thing. Then there's also like he pushes the limits of what of what we consider to be saintly. Yeah, when you, have sure. the, the, when you have the pugnacious uh, fools for Christ, you know, duking it out while yeah. walking on water. Walking on water. Yeah, man, that <laughs> stuff is crazy. I mean, a lot of people are like, "This you can't have this. This isn't this isn't right." But if you yeah. heard, and also the verge you know, on masochism, which he brings his character yes. to. You're sometimes you're wondering, like, is this just a, a kind of strange uh, masochism, like a kind of yeah. nihilistic masochism, or is this an actual negation of self like when he lets himself get stung by all the mosquitoes and stuff and you're like what you know really well, yes and well actually that i think you may have taken that from from an actual life of one of the russian saints yeah um so that that has that has happened <laughs> but even life. like that's the thing about the lives of the saints too is that when you read them there's is yeah. some of that in there right we we yes. tend to iron out the lives of the saints or the medieval legends we've kind of made them nice and clean even the fairy tales yeah we made them nice and clean. A lot of the versions of the fairy tales that we have now have have taken out all the strangeness that was there just a few yep. few centuries ago. And that's been one of my ideas is to how can we bring back the strangeness or some of the things that are that seem off color to to contemporary morality or sensibilities, but use it in a way that is re- revelatory rather than just mm-hmm. uh, a kind just of shocking. scandal for scandal or shocking, right? Shocking, right. like. I've been thinking about like the Rapunzel, for example, but in the original Rapunzel stories, Rapunzel gets pregnant in the tower. We've yeah. expunged that completely from all the versions that we tell our kids. Yeah. But I kept thinking without that, it actually is weakening what the story is about. And the idea of the yeah. man who forgets the mother of his children, you know, in this in the, his fall and then has to mm-hmm. hear her voice again in order to recognize her i'm like no we need to put that back in like is is there a way to put it back in even in a story for kids uh especially in a moment where kids are no longer like naive innocent in and and innocent the way that we wish they were because they're well you you say no longer but i'm not sure if they ever were if they ever were exactly yeah (laughs) so is there a way to put that back (laughs) to, to, to put it back in which would reveal a higher aspect of the story rather than just be for shock but that's just that's edgy. Like for kids, it's not that hard because you won't go as far. But for adults, yeah. it's a. Uh, how can I say this? Like it's a. Uh, it can be really tricky because there. Well, so much. So much of the modern fiction is like, is shock. A lot of it has a lot of shock for well, shock value for sure. 
So um, those of you who are watching on YouTube will see that we've suddenly uh, and magically changed our appearance. <clears throat> um, and there's a reason for that. Uh, we had technical difficulties because we were about to say something so incredible, Interesting. so astounding <laughs> that nobody out there wanted it to happen. Um, in actual fact, I was running out of ideas and it was a really good thing that that <laughs> happened because then I had to go back and, and uh, uh, read up answer. on... on yeah, and read up on a little bit of Jacques Derrida and stuff like that. And <laughs> it's like post structuralism, and, you know, it's a, a little evening of post structuralist theory. You know, you know, just a little bit of difference in my life. Yeah, you know, there you it's, go. It's exactly what I need. No, but in all seriousness, um, it was probably a good thing because uh, I was, uh, as we talked, as we talked about before, um, I do like to allow my thoughts to kind of wander when I'm out there uh, running around in, in the wild, which I do fairly a lot of because I, I train for a certain kind of sport called adventure racing, which we will not talk about today. But anyway, um, I was uh, thinking about uh, yesterday uh, the idea of how, mo how modernity fractures us and how um, what, what, what the value of shock is to, to let fractured people realize they're fractured. And this is where we this is where we ended last time. Where we were talking about how, with the kinds of stories that we're that that uh, we're being subjected to, <laughs> the kind of stories that we're surrounded by, um, it's very it's it's difficult to avoid as a as a writer, as a maker, as a creator uh, to use. It's it's difficult to avoid using shock just to get people out of a very comfortable buffered state that they exist in, because the reality is that everybody is really seriously fractured as a, as a result of modernity and until we realize that we are that fractured <clears throat> there really can't be any sort of integration or wholeness that can happen within the single person much less the larger society which was of course made so obvious by the pandemic and it's i think it's a mistake to think that the pandemic caused it uh the pandemic just made it obvious <clears throat> yeah just accentuated or it revealed something that was there yeah it accentuated but it also revealed how deep th that fracturing went and i think it's important also to to emphasize that that fracturing really is within each individual person it's not just a matter of some people uh, being revealed to have very dangerous ideologies that now must all be expunged right it's not that everybody was an anti it was a fascist and now the fascists have to be removed no it's all of us are are broken all of us are fractured and that's a function of the culture of uh, modernity um and I was listening to this podcast uh, yesterday, and this will connect back to how the margins work with storytelling in a second. But um, the this was a really interesting conversation between two makers, and one of them suggested that uh, there's that the con the connection between uh, fragmentation or fracturing that's happening around us, and the need for, I for the search for identity is not accidental, because identity he was saying in its root, the word identity is connected to uh, oneness. It's connected to unity. So I was, uh, it's been, this is a thought that's been percolating in my head and I haven't been able to fully articulate it yet. Maybe you can help me do that. Maybe we can do that for the rest of, of what's, what's happening today. But it's really striking to me that as, li as literacy declines, as people's engagement with old stories declines as people become in, inundated more and more in the kind of commercialized visual culture that we have identity seems to slip away more and more from people and they and they grasp for it a lot stronger so if you're considering for example this really bizarre and strange and, and terrifying thing that's happening especially with young girls where there where so many of them are now reaching out and searching for an identity that is other because they feel uncomfortable with the fracturing within them. What if part of the problem is that there has never, has not been enough of a integration through story that has been available to people in traditional cultures, because mm -hmm. the traditional culture has always embraced the journey to the, toward the other through a search of identity by crossing the line between the center and the margin by going from the village into the forest. But if there is no common tradition of storytelling, and if the stories that we do tell that are a proxy for that common tradition of storytelling are the new Marvel, are the new Star Wars, then where are you or all of us going to find that internal integration if it's not being offered in story? The only other option for some people is surgery. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
this is a thought that that I'm grasping for, and I haven't been able fully to articulate it yet. But I think there might be something to it. I think there might be something to the fact that maybe we just need a better unifying story that is shocking because we need to have that moment of shock initially mm-hmm. to for for the person to realize that their internal world is incredibly fractured. And if I can extend that a little bit, what really disturbs me is that is, is amongst people who do not like the idea of a unifying story or a common storytelling tradition, people generally tend to be more on more on the liberal uh, scale of things. It is almost anathema to suggest that there is such a thing as taste, that there is such a thing as good storytelling versus bad storytelling. All they can do is say, I have my preferences, you have yours, and don't you dare suggest to me that my preference is in some way inferior to yours. It's just a matter of taste, but mm-hmm. not taste in the, in the larger um, organic uh, objective sense of taste being determined by tastemakers, being mm-hmm. determined by, by cultural norms, right? It's a kind of personal thing that is in effect, especially in, in, the, in extreme cases, a kind of following of your passions. So why, this is why you have people who read 300 books a year, that all of them have the same theme. They all, they're all basically the same plot structure. They're the same character the same type of characters the same tropes that just keep reinforcing the, and most of them are trash keeps reinforcing the same fuzzy warm buffered feeling that separates you from the knowledge of your own internal fragmentation um so i don't know i don't know um uh, well i think that oh so that. i think that your intuition about identity is definitely right that's for that's for sure and the way to understand it um the best way to understand what's going on is to understand how, let's say, how sin works in us or how mm-hmm. our, our yeah. passions work with us. And so one of the things that happened, so let's say we could, you could say as Christians, we could say something like our identity is full to the extent that we participate in the body of Christ, like to the extent that we are little Christs, that Christ in us, like all the ways that yeah. St. Paul talks about. Like that is the fullness of our identity. And so in a way it is, it's the fullness of you, but it's also transpersonal. That is, it pulls yes. you out of your idiosyncratic, you know, uh, self. Uh, and so then you have within you, you, you have these pulls and these thoughts yeah. and these, these passions that they, they capture you. And when they capture you, they actually try to make you think that that's all you are. Yeah, you know, especially yeah. in the moment when you're when you're let's say taken by the passion, it's like the passion right. takes over, and that's what you are. And so, if you understand that at a and the those passions and those idiosyncratic patterns, they have a they have an appearance, and they have a mythological mm-hmm. appearance, right? Yes. They they actually have a an appearance in storytelling, um, mm-hmm. an appearance in 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 art, you know, and it's the demons. It's like the mixture it's the dark shadows in the eastern tradition these dark kind of shadows or in the western tradition it's these hybrid monsters uh right. that come to torture you right this all this this is this is a it's not like it's like it's not completely objective like a scientific mm-hmm. fact but it has a universality to it which yes. which is yes. which is pervasive and so what we're seeing is well, that's what we're seeing like we're seeing you know. those little identities take over people and that's why they look the way they look there, there is no yeah it, there's no hiding anymore it's like the right the, right and the, that's what that's why the hybridization is happening especially in western people like the western people are 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 clamoring for that hybridization because they think in that mixing of things is going to be some sort of full expression of the self of the of the internal integrity of the self which is so if you look at it from the side and and don't and, and try to just be dispassionate about it. It's total yeah. madness. Yeah. It's total it, madness. But okay, so this this then extends. So this, and I have another thought about that because that's what you're talking about. Then is a kind of full um, immersion in a dangerous other, while without realizing it that you're doing it because you think you're searching for the self, but actually what you're doing is letting in another, another, and that other will then subsume you. It'll it'll possess you, right? And this can happen in stories too. Now. So this is what's so interesting about the old uh, storytelling tropes, right? The old storytelling uh, styles is that they allow you to fully inhabit in a safe space the idea of being the other, because that's what reading is, right? Mm-hmm. If if you're reading and you're reading, you are 
in the mind and, and behind the eyes of a character that isn't you, that is a different sex, that there's a different skin color, that's a different social uh, status, you are fully inhabiting as much as that's possible, uh, that person's experience. And you're allowing that person's experience to, to inform your own. So you're simultaneously learning more about yourself, you're becoming more integrated in yourself, but you're also doing that by uh, setting interesting and useful boundaries between you and the other while also having an experience of the other that allows for a very um, into integrating type thing. So you, it's, you are self, but you're also other without losing self. Right. Well, that's because, yeah, well, that's because the space of imagination has a certain quality to it. It's not this, the, yeah. let's say the imaginary space is the fantastical space is not the same as the space with which you identify just yeah. so so i think that that's that's hard for people it might seem like an obvious thing to say but it yeah. is it is real so like let's say storytelling it's not the only function it can have but like you said it can have an exploratory function but that exploratory function is one which is which is recognizing that i'm entering into a fantastical space which is not yeah my space which is not me whereas what yeah. one of the things that's going on in terms of the um so that's one aspect of storytelling it's not the only one there is an aspect of storytelling which is also my story like you, you know yes. the trojan war is not a fantastical storytelling right it's my story mm -hmm. it's the story that i remember that i engage liturgically and participate in that's the same with the gospel stories or the same with you know the the liturgical year as the story that we participate in and engage with but the right. more fantastical right. type stories the ones that are like, like you said, where you you take you take the role of another. Let's say they have a function, but I think that what's going on, and that's one of the reasons why Star Wars is becoming a religion, is that we've made mm -hmm. it upside down. We've made this weird upside down relationship where we want to yeah. be some anime like you know anime character. We want to be Luke Skywalker, or we want to live yeah. in these imaginary worlds. Uh, and we hate our own story. <laughs> like we hate our own history. Yeah, we yeah. hate our own our 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 own legends. Uh, and so you can yeah. see. I mean, it really is a an image of the of the end. Like it is an image of this upside down place where now everything is. And then then that upside down place has many iterations, many forms. It can look like that strangeness of of cosplay, but it can also look like you said, which is the fetishization of strangeness and a desire mm -hmm. to take all strangeness into myself, become, an, become a hybrid animal, you know, fetishize, uh, uh, you know, and now we're seeing more like the race changing where people are want to yes. be another race or, you know, it's like yeah. all of these types of behaviors can, can demonstrate the problem, the problem, the confusion, or even the inversion between the idea of a, of a story, which is remembering my, my, con my connection and a story which is this exploratory dreamlike experience of, you know, of, uh, yeah, of fighting monsters and doing so all that. So it's, it's an inversion of hierarchy again. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> There's no doubt about that it is, that it's like a weird upside down place that we're standing in. Well, but I think, it's, so I think there are ways to, so I think there are ways to flip it. To be there, right? yeah. There are ways yeah. to flip it, I think. And I think that that's the space that we're in. And that's, it's an exciting space actually to be in, which is, you know, can we tell the fantastical stories in a way that will surprise us back into our own story? Or can we tell right. the, our, our story in a way that will be slightly fantastical, but to shock us back into it? You know, I think that that's definitely possible right now. Well, it's it seems to be the, the, the best time for it. I mean, I've talked before about how fantasy as, as a storytelling um, as a storytelling mechanism is just better right now because people have become saturated with the storytelling um, approaches of realistic fiction. And because in 20th century, in the, in the 20th century, realistic fiction has become little more than a, a my story that is nothing, that is almost nothing more than a constant regurgitation of internal um, fragmentation. And yeah. who would want to read that? <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, very small group of people who are who very much uh, you know appreciate that internal regurgitation because that's all they do all day. Yeah. But you know, for the rest of us, um, let's find something a little bit different. <laughs> yeah. And so I think that like if you follow the the line, let's say between 
someone if you follow the line also between like realistic fiction if you look at the 19th century romantic and the early 20th century realists and then you move into the surprise of 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 lewis and tolkien and yeah. the inklings and this kind of weird the surprise it was already there like it, it is a continuation of the romantics to a certain extent mm -hmm. yeah. but it's an interesting idea like i really like the idea that tolkien and c.s lewis were kind of writing the old testament for us like an Old mm -hmm. Testament for, for, for today, which is that how can we now make that next step? And I, there are probably several solutions. Like the one that I decided, that we decided, my brother and I, was to tell a fantastical version of our story in a way that is, is in some way scandalous because it's like it's changing yeah. the characters, it's doing all this, but it's hopefully <laughs> pointing you back towards your own real legendarium, like to our own true legendarium. Which, you know, in order to be able to engage with that legendary, you have to come to love it again. And um, that's, that's, the tr that's the trick and the trouble here. And unfortunately, uh, it, is, it is a critical moment for that. Because as I'm, as I'm looking at it, attempted expressions of this, such as the new Rings of Power show, which I've only started to watch, um, there, this internal conflict is between... Cre uh, loving your old legendarium and telling it in a fresh way or rewriting the old legendarium to fit the be better than new paradigm. That co conflict is very strong in that show. Yeah. And it's, it's very interesting to see it pan out and part, part of it is just stupid storytelling choices, but part of it is this, is this insistence and I, okay. So I, I'm probably getting in trouble for, for raising this in the first place, but the idea of uh, diverse casting is you can argue about this and you can talk about this actually much longer than people are willing to to do because most people either uh, come come into one of two extreme camps one uh, you're a racist uh two uh, you're a woke garbage person right uh, and neither the twain shall meet ever but uh there have been very interesting examples of of diverse casting in in films that i like very much in the 90s there was a wonderful shakespeare adaptation called much ado about nothing by kenneth brana that uh, used colorblind casting um and uh, as a kid initially my, my first impression my first impression of a black guy and keanu reeves being blood brothers was like huh but like within the first five minutes of it passing i'm like okay this is i don't care because the actors are so good but of course this is shakespeare and it's been adapted so many different times in so many different ways that there's a lot of space for it to be adapted in new and interesting ways so that's one possible way of looking at it the problem is, though, of course, that the way the reason that most of the pro people for diverse casting are talking about this is the following. You have this vast swath of young people who have a certain skin color and they read Tolkien and they see Tolkien on the screen and they cannot associate themselves with the characters on the screen or on the page. Therefore, we must change the skin color of some of the main characters so that these poor children are able to associate with those uh, imagined characters and inhabit this fantastical space which is a pro proposition that is extremely flawed yeah, because it's, really, it's ridiculous well, well it's, so because it's, it's a fantastical world like it's not right i mean it's, it's not real be, like uh, i mean yeah oh man my, my point is that it, it removes from the table the possibility that one can have an experience of an other that is integrative and that yeah. is and that doesn't remove the experience of the self so that's that's something that i find problematic I'll, I'll leave it there because it is a very thorny issue but my point is that you're right this is a very interesting moment because this show could have been something that started to reintegrate people on a large scale mm. i think that the peter jackson movies started to do it even though they took they took a few um wrong turns in, in some of the interpretation but well look general, at look at give me give you an example of someone who actually did that right now and and it's funny because yeah. it's not our led it's it's the it's the guy that keeps haunting me is so so neil yeah. neil gaiman wrote a version of the the northern gods legend yeah and and it's perfect like it's it's yeah. super well told. It's very respectful of the story. It's basically a retelling mm -hmm. of these legends in a way that is celebratory. That that has a kind of bombastic uh, um, feel to it. You know, it has this this mm -hmm. this energy to it. And the of course the only reason why he could do that is because it's not Christian. Like it's a it's it's northern yeah. and it's pagan, and therefore yeah. it's okay to do that. But yeah. I mean, the the technique and the style and the possibility is there for us 
to to take like we could do that for some of the a lot let's say a lot think of all the the wild stories from the golden legend or from russian uh yeah, yes, hagiography. Russian fairy tales. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> knows. Yeah, or the Russian fairy tales. Nobody knows these stories. Uh, and they could be retold in ways that would surprise everybody. The Middle Ages is actually an amazing source because, because mm -hmm. it's the Dark Ages. Nobody knows the stories. Like nobody knows the legends of Alexander. Nobody knows some of a yeah. lot of these Arthurian romances. Uh, like I, I made a video on this Arthurian romance called Silence, you know, which mm -hmm. is so fascinating. I mean, like Merlin is in it is this like crazy man who laughs the whole time. And oh my like god! Crazy is Merlin is the greatest character ever. I love Crazy Merlin. It's like so it's he, like he sh he shows up in the really ancient Welsh uh, yeah. legends. The guy was nuts. He was off his rocker crazy. And he's like so interesting. Man. Yeah, like a wild yes. man of the forest. And so it's like that yeah. version of Merlin could be retold, could be told in a way that could be super fascinating for people to discover. And th but there's yeah. that's just one example. There are many many yeah. other examples. And so it seems like it's a, I, I really do feel like it's a, it could be an exciting moment. And also because yeah. when they retell, when, let's say when the, the, the people in Hollywood, you know, redo the Green Knight, yeah. they fail. Like, I don't know what to tell you. They fail because they're, they're, yeah. they're crippled with their, their desire to, to inject their message into it. And so because of it, they, they don't do a good job. Well, yeah, because, well, it's, it's not just their desire to, to inject their message. It's, these people like the director of the Green Knight. I have a lot of respect for him. He's a very interesting person. And I think he's trying to do something. Um, well, so the problem is that these people honestly believe um, that meaning can only be made by the self mm -hmm. without a reference point to an objective standard. And this this calls this harks back to that um, graphic artists um, that you talked to, the, the famous guy, Ben Hadke, his, yeah. his, um, his absolute resistance to considering the possibility of there being a best story ever told because then it it means that my story the one i have to make for myself the meaning making mechanism that i have will be somehow will be somehow impoverished because there's something greater than me instead of seeing it as a, as a possibility to uh, align yourself as much as humanly possible to to an infinitely beautiful model it becomes a limiting factor because mm -hmm. meaning must be made only within. But you know what? It's happening already. It's happening. It's happening on the edges, on the margins. There, you know, the aforementioned Martin Shaw uh, did a collaboration with a with a now recently deceased poet named Tony Hoagland called Cinderbiter, which, by the way, if you have, if you people haven't read it, you have to. It's a retelling of ancient Celtic uh, folk tales in modern poetic form. Obviously, this is marginal stuff. Not a lot of people are going to read it, but it's life changing poetry mm -hmm. it really is and if you can force yourself to get through it it's really incredible uh paul king's north stories are yeah. also marginal but they're that's what they're doing they're engaging with uh deep very profound real um re objective realities that form that can have the possibility of forming our internal reality um who, who else i had somebody else that i was well i mean when i read that when i read beast i was i was astounded it was like, because I, I, you know, when I was younger, I was also, I was one of those people that read a lot of modern literature. And, and when I read Beast, I was like, this is like Tolkien and Beckett. Like how did Tolkien yes. and Beckett yes. come together? <laughs> it's like smash. <laughs> yes. And I thought yeah. this is yeah. a real interesting possibility. Like to take James Joyce, like for example, there's things in James Joyce, which are astoundingly powerful. And there's some yes. things in James Joyce with their, which are just like unbearably horrible. Like, yes. You know, and so yeah. so you there are some Indulgent. like the desire in modernism to unite form form and meaning even in the grammar yeah. and in the manner yes. in like the structure like that's something which can be taken and can be yeah. can be used for very very powerful means because that's what you have. Well, well that's what T. S. Eliot did so well. That's what yeah. T. S. Eliot did so well in all of his poetry, right? So if you, but again, you need that shock, right? You need to be shocked into it because if you just come into it without. Uh, without being prepared, it wash over you. It's too difficult. It's too it's too structurally vast. It's complicated. Um, so okay, well, the, I just remembered another one that, that's doing it. So Richard Powers is a is a Pulitzer Prize winning um, author. He wrote a book called The Overstory. Now he used to be a guy who lived in tech, um, and I listened to an interview with him between him and Ezra Klein, who's somebody that's very much on the left, and somebody that I listened to as a palate cleanser for me to to remember why i think the way i do just to remember how the other side 
Oh Lord. Okay. Anyway, um, so <laughs> the, the, Richard Powers is a guy who used to sit at table with the the uh, Silicon Valley tech people who used to honestly, in all earnestness, talk about just hold on a little, a little more, and immortality is within our grasp, whether it's biological or it's informational. Mm-hmm. I mean, these are actual serious conversations that these people are having. So, like cryogenically freezing my brain, etc. That sort of thing, right? The sort of thing that C.S. Lewis described so beautifully in that hideous strength, um, you know. And that, by the way, a lot of people are. Uh, recognizing that this uh, Kevin Kelly kind of technology has its own will thing is actually just an entry point for demonic powers. But, um, but Richard Powers was uh, in this and he's, he finally kind of snapped out of it. And the reason he snapped out of it is because he recognized that my personal meaning making mechanism, as he expressed it, my way of making meaning. And he's somebody who's capable of doing it. A writer, somebody who's, who's extremely well read, uh, educated, living in a very culturally rich place, uh, the, the Bay Area of, of San Francisco in California, surrounded by the best, the brightest people in the world. And his meaning-making me, meaning making mechanism broke down. He was unable to make it anymore. And where did he find it? In, as he calls it, the more than human world. He, he went out into nature and he found in there presences that were greater than he in his mind. Of course, that's, you know, what he's actually feeling. Um, I dare say, is an, an inkling of natural revelation. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing that Paul Kingsnorth felt uh, when he was a Wiccan priest, the same thing that Martin Shaw is now feeling when, when you know, as he, as he says, Jesus wrestled me to the ground and wouldn't let, wouldn't let me get up. <laughs> Jesus, the, the mossy-faced Jesus that, that, yeah. he, that he encountered in the, in the wild. Uh, so what happens on the edges, what happens on the margins is indicative of what's going to be mainstream in 10, 15, 20 years. Yeah. So if that's the case, then let's get going and let's start writing into that space because soon it's going to be everywhere. Yeah. No, I think, I think for people that are watching, if you're an artist, if you're a writer, this is an exciting time, you, you know, and the exciting as we watch, even as we watch the AI art, you know, appear yeah. as we watch the AI writing, which will probably, it's probably being used by some people without us knowing, but it's probably, it's all there. 100%. <laughs> you know, as we're, as we're watching, as we're watching this, I think that it feels like as something is being exhausted, there's definitely something else that is being born and we can get an inkling of that in, in the things that, uh, that Nicholas is, is bringing up. So, uh, yeah, so it's, it's an exciting time. Artists get to it. You know, we need to, we, we have, there are better stories and we need to tell them and there are better images. We need to make them. Yeah. But you know, for us artists, it's not as easy as just simply sitting down and doing the thing. Like there's, there's, there's things we have to do with ourselves um, that, that need to make it, that will make it possible for us to tell those stories. It's not simply, okay, now I have to do this. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to create this thing. We have to form ourselves. We have to, there, there are certain things that we have to do um, very intensely to our imaginations and to our uh, internal fragmented selves because we are fragmented too. We have to work on that internal wholeness, uh, not in both a, a spiritual sense, but also in an artistic sense. Um, you know, we we need to we need to have occasional fasts from visual culture. We need to like stop watching stuff all the time on our phones and on our like seriously. Yeah, because it, we're saturated. There's no space in which we can we can allow for you know, the richness of our imagination, which is so good at connecting things outside of what it sees. We need to like fill ourselves with beauty in all different forms. You know, if you're a writer, go and listen to some music, right? Uh, if you're, if you're a visual artist, go read something that's, that's outside of your normal um, uh, palette, right? Immerse yourself in beauty in all different kinds of things, but also limit, limit how much you're, you are, infusing your eyes with the garbage because there's so much out there yeah all right nicholas so so tell people where they can find your stuff where they can find your novels you're also doing podcasts uh yeah let them know i'm doing too much yes it's true Uh, i i should apply my uh what i just said to myself and cut out half the things i do just just to allow space for (laughs) for internal wholeness but you know i'm working on it yeah everything you can find everything on my website uh, nicholascotard.com including uh the the new novella that we talked about which is free uh it's on it's not for sale anywhere this is a an experimental thing i'm doing i'm giving it out in ebook format for free 
to anyone who signs up to my uh, newsletter, which you can do on the front page of my website. So go and get it. So go check it out. And and for those who don't know, Nicholas and I are also, we've also started working together more explicitly. And so we are, uh, we're, we're working towards the uh, Snow White story that I've mentioned a few times and in the hopes of maybe moving towards some really great uh, fairy tales in the future. Nicholas is also an expert on fairy tales. He has a, a, a wonderful podcast on Russian fairy tales that you can check out from his website as well. Uh, and so there's going to be a lot of exciting stuff in the future. Uh, you'll hear more from Nicholas and myself on all that very soon. So thanks, everybody.